then, Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, you know, there's all kinds of things I'm supposed to say here. Um, I have a list. But uh, mostly I want to say thanks to, uh, to Norman Fisher for being here. And this is kind of a new initiative. Some of you might know this. We've been doing this for a couple of years now, where instead of inviting somebody to just come and give a typical kind of one-off academic, academic talk, and then we go out and have dinner with them, and then they leave. Um, so uh, Norman Fisher has been in residence for about two or three days, in spite of various plane issues and whatnot. <laughs> and he will be here for a little while longer, doing a variety of things, uh, seminars with students only, and other kinds of things. So we're very grateful to that. And it's part of a larger project. Uh, let's see if we can get to the larger project. Um, uh, called uh, Putting Pen to Palm Leaf. So um, uh, it's about Buddhism and literature. And we were thinking about this in, in, the, in the college, in the department. Um, uh, Jay Garfield is maybe here somewhere. Right there. There he is, and Blaine. Um, and they, they had this inspiration. We should be doing more about <coughs> art. We should be more engaged with the creative element and things. So putting, palm to, uh, putting pen to palm leaf is bringing uh, to the campus uh, four different speakers, as I said, engaged in a 10-day ten, ten to two-week kind of program with students and faculty and seminars. And uh, Norman Fisher is the first, and I will hold this up here. Uh, our own Ruth Ozeki down there. Uh, is next, and then um, Kate Wheeler and Jane Hirschfield. Uh, so it's a great collection of people speaking about very important and kind of and contemporary issues that are um, that are going to be a lot of fun. So that was my job. Was to say, oh, I'm probably also s supposed to thank all of the people who paid for this, but they know who they are, so forget that. Um, <laughs> next, I'm going to. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Ruth Ozeki, who is our own, uh, she's a, a smithy. Many of you, uh, she's two times, I think that's a record, uh, has had her book as the book that first year students read before they come uh, to campus. And um, it's for her. Nepotism. <laughs> <laughs> I have children. I'm up above, I, I can do nepotism, right? So, anyways, uh, so uh, Ruth, uh, who is more qualified than I, will introduce Norman. Thank you. Is this a good place yeah, to go over there. I'm going to stand at the podium. Yeah, stand at the podium. Okay. Yes, yes. Jamie, this is your iPad over here. Jamie, you this is this is your iPad. Thank you. It's yeah. not an iPad. Oh, Whatever it is. Yeah. I hate her. This is. Yeah. Whatever it is. Yeah. <laughs> I hate her. I hate her. Um, hi, everybody. It's it's um it's it's wonderful to be here. Welcoming uh welcoming Norman to Smith. Um, I I. Uh, I have the great honor of, of um, being Norman's student and uh, his Zen student. So this is, for me, this is particularly uh, a, a, you know, a pleasure. Um, Norman Fisher, I'm sure uh, everyone knows, Norman Fisher is a poet and a Zen Buddhist priest and teacher. Um, he is a graduate of the Iowa Writers' Workshop and has a master's um, also uh, from the Graduate Theological Institute at the University of California at Berkeley. Um, he's been publishing poetry since 1979 um, and uh, has been a priest for 35 years now, uh, serving as the abbot of the San Francisco Zen Center uh, from 1995 to 2000. He's also the founder of the Everyday Zen Foundation. Um, and, and I'm just going to put in a little plug here uh, for the Everyday Zen Foundation website, um, which I also happen to edit. Um, <laughs> and, and there are thousands, I think, hundreds, thousands of Dharma talks up there at this point um, that Norman has given and also uh, teachers in the lineage have given as well. So I really recommend it. It's www.everydayzen.org. <laughs> um, and Norman is also one of the senior Zen teachers in America right now. Um, I lose track of how many books Norman has published, um, but I think at last count it was something like 20 books of poetry and eight books about Zen Buddhism. Um, he is extremely prolific. Um, his poetry and essays have been anthologized and published in too many publications to even mention. Uh, Norman has been an active member of the Bay Area poetry scene for many years. Um, his work is associated with the language poets as well as beat poets like Philip Whelan, um, Gary Snyder, and Michael McClure, who are his close friends and mentors. <coughs> um, in the introduction to his poetry collection, I was blown back 
Norman writes about how, for a long time, he felt that his poetry and religious practice were separate, but that after a while, he noticed that he was writing somewhat unintentionally about intimate religious experience. And perhaps this is why critics and readers often comment on the warmth, kindness, and humility um, in this body of work that is also characterized by its sharp intelligence and penetrating inquiry into what it means to be human, alive in language. Um, I'd like to conclude this introduction by reading just the first paragraph of an essay that he wrote called Why I Have to Write. And um, I, we actually made copies of this essay, and, um, and I have copies here for people to take um, on the way out. And it's a, it's a beautiful essay, and it's one that really speaks to my heart, um, which is why I'm going to read the first part of it. Norman writes, though I know writing is a bad habit for a Zen priest, I can't help it. I seem to be writing all the time. I write poems of several varieties in several voices, journal entries, dharma talks, essays, books, notes, lists, stories, emails, blogs. In doing all this, I have no special purpose I can discern or explain. Though I hope it does somebody some good, I'm not at all sure. It may even do some harm. More likely, it may be just a waste of time. What am I doing when I write? I'm not documenting my life for friends or posterity, nor am I telling anybody something they don't already know or need to hear from me. Why go on? I'm compelled to, delighted to. There seems to be something crucial about working with language, something that wakes me up or brings me a quality of density or significance to my life, even though I can't say what that significance is, more than that it is a feeling or a texture. Besides, Writing is a deep pleasure, and besides that, I have always written, seem to be a writer by temperament and impulse, and what writers do is write. They can't help themselves. <laughs> Maybe I should get over this. Maybe there's an adhesive patch I can put on that will block the neural <laughs> pathways that lead me down the arteries of language. But if there were, I wouldn't wear it. <laughs> So from here, Norman goes on to <laughs> contemplate this question, where does this need to splash around in language come from? Um, and I suspect that perhaps in his talk tonight, he will suggest some answers to this question, or perhaps he won't, and we'll do something else entirely. So we'll see. But in any case, please join me in welcoming Norman Fisher. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Hi, thanks for coming. Thanks for introducing me, Ruth, and Jamie for introducing the program. I don't usually uh, go around to uh, colleges and give talks, so it's really fun for me to do that. It makes me say something I or otherwise wouldn't say, think about something I otherwise wouldn't think about, and that's good because we all end up thinking about the same stuff over and over again, so it's nice to have a kick in the butt to do something else. So I'm going to uh, read for you a text of my talk called Writing at Degree Zero, but I'm going to begin by giving you instructions how to listen to this talk. Okay? So here are the instructions. This talk takes about 40 minutes to read. So get comfortable, feel your body on your seat, pay attention to that, feel your breathing, and you will notice that there is going to be a lot going on besides my talk, your body, your, your breathing. So notice as much of that other stuff as you can. If your mind wanders while I'm speaking, <coughs> let it. And notice where your mind goes 
when it trails off. Then bring your mind back to the words you are hearing so that you can find refreshed reasons to let your mind wander again. Your wandering mind, should your mind wander, it doesn't necessarily have to wander, I'm saying, should it wander, is an intentional part of this talk. So don't worry if you miss something. It actually doesn't matter at all. Because the talk doesn't make a point. It doesn't tell you anything or contain a cogent argument. Also, the talk is being recorded, so if you miss something, you can always go back and hear it again. <coughs> After the words of the talk have all been read, the talk will then be completed by a short period of silence that will be a minute or two long during which you can just note what your experience is in that minute or two. Though brief, that last part of the talk is the most significant part of the talk. So those are the instructions for listening to the talk. Now, the talk. When someone asks you today for the title of a talk you will give at some future date, <laughs> and it is not clear to you whether that date or this one will ever occur, whether time will reverse or coil or twist or snap or utterly end before, after, or on a given date, and what is a date? Is it sweet? <laughs> there is nothing you can do but respond with the first thought that comes to mind, writing at degree zero. What does this phrase mean, writing at degree zero? What is its origin? For what reason did it appear to you in your mind, and is one constrained in giving a talk to speak in some way that appears to reference the title of the talk one is giving? <laughs> or can one simply ignore the title altogether and speak to the condition of the moment in which the talk is being given? And will one always do that anyway, regardless of the words employed or the time in which they were composed? As it happens, writing at degree zero is the title of a book I have never read by the French philosopher, literary critic, and semiotician Roland Barthes written in response to a text by Jean-Paul Sartre, a serious and anxious Frenchman. <laughs> and a theoretical Marxist who wrote of the political nature of all writing at a time when all writing in France was thought to be inescapably political. Writing is in no way an instrument for communication, Roland Barthes wrote. It is not an open route through which there passes only the intention to speak. Writing is a hardened language which is self-contained. It is meant to impose thanks to the shadow cast by its system of signs, the image of a speech which had a structure even before it came into existence. 
It appears symbolical, introverted, ostensibly turned toward an occult side of language. Writing is rooted in something beyond language. It develops like a seed, not a line. It manifests an essence and holds the threat of a secret. It is an anti-communication. It is intimidating. There exists fundamentally in writing a circumstance foreign to language. There is, as it were, the weight of a grace conveying an intention which is no longer linguistic. This gaze may well express a passage of language. It may also express the threat of retribution. The word becomes an alibi, an elsewhere, and a justification. In the beginning, by ten utterances, by mere statement of intention, by words, even the words in the beginning, we have learned. Rabbi Chia and Rabbi Natan say, by a single utterance was it created as it was written. For he speaks, he writes, and it is written. By this, it is created. Not ten, but a single utterance. But how can this be? One utterance only. By the sea, within the sea, above the sea, the cloud, the broom, that's B-R-U-M-E, the broom, the chaos before the sea. In this and any language by the wind, within the wind, under and over and above the wind, as it is written, by the stuttering wind, by the breaking of great trees in shrouded distances, by shrouded distances themselves, within, below, beyond, close and far above, by the known and unknown, in single, incalculable utterance. Even a single letter. Even a sounded exhale by the wind hovers tenebrous over hooded waters. Each exhale, incendiary expiration of being disappearance within utterance. Single letter sounded <sighs> as house opening at left top under roof and from below, through which rushes the yet-to-be. Which brings us now to poetry, which long ago was merely an ornamental version of prose, so that one could ask, what does this poem say? And the question could be answered in language other than the poem itself. Poetry then did not evoke a particular domain, a special coherence, or separate universe, but only the individual handling of a verbal technique, that of expressing oneself according to artistic and sociable rules, an outward projection of an inner thought made socially acceptable by virtue of the very conspicuousness of its conventions. Contemporary poetry is otherwise. It is without antecedents, though it must push out from them. It renounces signs since it comes 
sorry, since it carries the nature within itself. Poetic time is no longer a fabrication. It is a possible adventure, the meeting point of sign and intention, a hole you fall into and never come back. Poetry destroys the functional nature of language and leaves standing only its lexical basis down there in that hole which may be at the center of the known universe or nowhere at all. With poetry, the word shines forth a line of relationships emptied of their content. Grammar is bereft of its purpose. It is now only an inflection that exists, exists to present the word which is the dwelling place down there in that star hole, which can never be untrue, which is whole, W-H-O-L-E, which shines with an infinite freedom and prepares to radiate toward innumerable and uncertain possible connections. The word is a vertical project, a monolith, a pillar of a totality of meanings, a sign which stands accompanied by all possible associations, an unexpected object, a Pandora's box from which fly out all the unexpected potentialities of language which produces a sacred relish full of gaps and lights, absences and overnourishing signs, a sort of zero. There is no humanism in contemporary poetry, only heaven, hell, holiness, madness, childhood, pure matter. The poem was imagined not as a fixed voice of, self, of a self-contained ego conveying a predetermined or paraphrasable message, but as a collage or constellation of textual elements, not voice, but voicings. The expression in the poem is not in the message of the poet's autonomous lyric voice, but in the process of an effective and dynamic compositional field while the conventional lyric stated or named its emotional content. This new poetry enacted its effective state. The move was from emptied out emotional behavior to a new linguistic sentience. The self was not something assumed in such poems, but found in the act of collaboration with the language of the poem and the reader's response. This is me. I could have been you. This is me in relation to another possible me I might have been. It's me, not you. You aren't me. You're you. You're you to my me. Me and you equals us. We are us. This is the me created by your wishful thinking. This is the me language tricks you into noticing. 
this is me, whether you like it or not. This is you. I'm not subject to your expectations. I'm not subject at all. This is the me that needs to express itself to you. And this monstrous me seems to appear everywhere you look. This is me taking up all the air in the room. The author is me. Or no, it's you. <laughs> this is me, necessarily a figment of your imagination. This is me, modified by you. This is me, all neatly packaged as you. This is me redacted. <laughs> this is my artifact, an example of how time eats your face. This isn't me. It must be you thinking of me. This is you, a figment of my dilemma. And this is what happens when you're me. To reflect on the impossible matter of the nature of a political art in conditions that exclude it by definition may not be the worst way of marking time. Indeed, I imagine that postmodern political art might turn out to be an interminable conjecture on how it could be possible in the first place. If interpretation is understood in the thematic way as the disengagement of a fundamental theme or meaning, <clears throat> then it seems clear that the postmodernist text resists meaning. Once upon a time, at the dawn of capitalism and middle class society, there emerged <clears throat> something called the sign, which seemed to entertain unproblematical relations with its referent. This initial heyday of the sign the moment of literal or referential language or of the unproblematic claims of so-called scientific discourse came into being because of the corrosive dissolution of older forms of magical language. By a force which I will call reification, a force whose logic is one of ruthless separation and disjunction, of specialization and rationalization, of a division of labor in all realms. Unfortunately, that force which brought traditional reference into being continued unremittingly being the very logic of capital itself. Thus the first moment of decoding or of realism cannot long endure. By a dialectical reversal, it then turns in itself 
becomes the object of the corrosive force of a reification which enters the realm of language to disjoin the sign from the referent. And such a disjunction does not completely abolish the referent or the objective world of reality, which continue to entertain a feeble existence on the horizon, like a shrunken star or a red dwarf. But reality's great distance from the sign now allows the sign to enter a moment of autonomy, of a relatively free-floating utopian existence as over against its former objects, the autonomy of culture. the semi-autonomy of language is the moment of modernism. In a realm of the aesthetic which redoubles the world without being altogether of it, thereby winning a certain negative or critical power, but also a certain otherworldly futility. Yet the force of reification which was responsible for this new moment does not stop there either. In another stage, heightened reification penetrates the sign itself and disjoins the signifier from the signified. Now reference and reality disappear altogether and even meaning the signifier, is a problem. We are left with that pure and random play of signifiers we call postmodernism, which no longer produces monumental works of the modernist type, but ceaselessly reshuffles the fragments of pre-existing texts the building blocks of older culture and social production it's some, in some new and heightened bricolage, meta-books, which cannibalize other books, meta-texts, which collate bits of other texts. Such is the logic of the postmodern. Guishan asks Da Wu, where are you coming from? And da Wu says, I've come from tending the sick. Guishan says, how many people were sick? Da Wu says, well, there were the sick and the not sick. Guishan says, isn't the one not sick you? Dawu said, being sick and not being sick have nothing to do with it. Speak, speak. Weishan said, even if I could say anything, it would have no relation. All of us are sick. All of us are not sick. We are trying to get cured. What would a cure look like? Who will cure us? Or can we cure ourselves? Is there something wrong with our concept of sick and our concept of cure? And is our reification of a concept of sick and a concept of cure, the reason for our sickness and our cure. In the beginning, by 10 utterances, by eating the apple of the tree of knowledge, of good and evil, of this and that, because having a body, we were hungry and we're made to eat. 
that woke us to the world, that caused us to identify ourselves as ourselves and what is not ourselves and other than ourselves, and the ones we desperately seek to love as distant male of female of them and everything in between and beyond by word created in desperate longing, in violence, in blood. And what can we do about that? And what if there is nothing to be done about that? But that knowing that is what can be done about it. Still, we who are sick visit the sick who are also sick and discuss this later with friends, though our words, soaring freely, have no relation. I am retrospective. I dig up tombs. I write biographies, read yesterday's papers. Not seeing anything of even passing importance, let alone of ultimate significance in my immediate surroundings, I study what others have considered worthwhile. But why should I not have my own original thought? Why not see the truth with my own eyes? Why not ignore tradition and try for a fresh and unadulterated thought? Why not find my own religion instead of choosing to follow one some other has invented? I am, after all, inundated by floods of reality, raw and direct. I see and hear and taste and feel firsthand. Why do I grope around in past's dusts for something to think about? Why should I read another book? Why put on the old faded clothing I've inherited from my forebears? And aren't I being buried alive by history? Today the sun is shining. As far as I know, it never shone before. Today I saw flowers. They are not the same. Neither are the people I meet anything like the people in ages gone by. These people are unfathomable and incomprehensible because they are alive, their stories not yet stories, for they are still in progress. Like me, they have questions that are unanswerable and unaskable, even unknowable according to the indecipherable order of things. Each life is the unique, in-process solution to a never-before-conceived puzzle. Each person shines forth as truth, however much that person's light seems dimmed by thought coverings. Nature is immediately its own design, for no one designed it. The universe was created not in six days, but in four minutes and 33 seconds of the seventh day. Let us examine the real ends for which we were born. This is science's purpose, and yet there is still so far to go. We become lost in details, weeds, and fail to feel the prevailing winds everywhere ruffling the hair of our heads. We become frivolous in our serious attention to things. The most abstract truth is the most practical because it covers the most ground. 
and evidence is everywhere. Language, sleep, madness, dreams, beasts, sex. The universe is composed of nature and the soul. So all that's not me, including art and civilization and other people and plants, animals, and my body is nature. Since my inquiry is so general and broad, and since, like everyone else, I'm inventing my own terms, there is no problem with accuracy. Since I have thought it, it is so and no confusion will occur. Nature refers to essences no person can change. Space, life apart from its forms. The air, the river, the mountain, the cloud have ceased to be natural, if ever they were, for they are as subject to human will as a house, a statue, a picture. A little chipping, baking, patching, and washing. To be solitary, I must leave my house. For there, even if no one else is present, I am not alone. The residue of myself <coughs> intrudes. Another person I once was. So to be alone, I must stand outside to look at the stars. Venus, Jupiter, Saturn, Mars, the moon, all in alignment, brightly scooped across the black sky. Their illumination will separate me from the world. Thanks to them, I will be driven out. One might imagine the stars exist for this purpose. Suppose the stars did not appear on a daily basis, but only once in a thousand years. How thunderstruck one would be and would preserve the memory as a myth, no one would believe, except as a metaphor. Yet every night, this myth shows itself plainly with an astonishing smile. The stars are always inaccessible, though our experience of them is so close and immediate. But this is true of everything in nature. Nature is never mean or threatening. Exactly its hiddenness accounts for its cheery demeanor. It doesn't know us, so it can't be dismayed. It doesn't know us, so it can't be dismayed. <laughs> so it's cheerful. <laughs> Yet we try to know nature, always failing. We receive tantalizing details all of which serve to throw us off track. And nature is no toy. The flowers, the mountains, the clouds never fail to evoke our most sublime thoughts in old as well as early age, despite our essential ignorance of them. And this is the source of the poetic in us. Poetry is nature in its hiddenness, impressing itself upon our ignorance. That which we make use of is no longer poetic. An unspoiled tree in the forest is poetic. Not knowing us, it is free of us and invokes our humility. Our not knowing it, despite the facts in our possession, which are always linguistic and essentially mystical, <coughs> gives rise to utter magnification so that we can include it in all of nature in a stroke. 
of time in a word, which is poetry. There is no property, just as there is no body. I no more own my house or farm whose ultimate fate supersedes my own than I own my body that belongs to the earth from, whom's, from whose elements it is fashioned. Control or possession is poetry's folly, the source of all satirical writing. The landscape or seascape we grace, sorry, the landscape or seascape we gaze on frees our eyes of the illusion of personhood and private perception. Hence landscape, seascape, and skyscape at any and all scales is poetry. The best part of such sky, sea, and landscapes is the element beyond the horizon which poetry sees with words' eyes, which are the mind of a subject. Most people cannot see the sun. Children see the sun because, as yet, they do not know who they are. Their outward and inward senses have not yet adjusted to the world's noise only they are adjusted to one another. So to the child, the word is a token of affection. Its sole meaning source is there. Poetry is childish. No responsible, property-owning adult should engage it. Only fools pay attention to poetry. When I began to practice intensive Zen meditation many, many years ago, two things soon became impossible for me in writing. First, it became impossible to be self-conscious. By this I mean it became impossible for me to strategize toward a standard of excellence and to fret about how well I was realizing that standard. Not that I entirely stopped doing these things, but that realizing that they were impossible, I couldn't take myself seriously when I did them. Second, it became impossible not to notice that when I was writing, that's what I was doing. I was writing. That is, the most important and obvious fact of writing was that my mind was engaging words, and that words per se were so strong in their presence that not only could I not ignore them, I had to write taking strongly into account the presence of words themselves and the feeling of being human with words. And that words were an oddly disjunct and mysterious experience. The result of the, these two impossibilities was freedom. I felt free of myself, free of standards, and free of the need to force words to do what I wanted them to do. I could let words be as they were. In Zen meditation, I was just sitting. That is, I was literally sitting and breathing and allowing whatever happened to happen without shaping my experience. In practicing like this, I was allowing myself to be myself, but also seeing myself in a wider scope, the scope of being alive and dying, which we usually call time. In writing, I found that I had to do the same thing 
only in language, in words, phrases, lines, or sentences. I could let myself come and go and allow the words to find their own reasons. I was free to improvise. Later, I found I could also revise, even revise repeatedly, in the same improvisatory spirit, trusting the shapes and meanings that arose from the play of mind and words. As a consequence, I became quite interested in literary form as a conditioning factor. Almost every piece of writing I do is, in my mind at least, a formal discovery. This does not make my writing particularly original. Originality is beside the point. I very much feel that the words are, of course, not mine. They have circulated through the mouths and brains of innumerable speakers over the generations so that engaging writing is also an act of solidarity and love. Religion is childish, and it ought to be. It ought to help us recapture something that gets lost in the process of growing up. It ought to foster a sense of play, a sense of magic, a sense of humor. Probably it's too hard to cultivate these qualities within the normative forms of any religious tradition so working with the imagination through art is good for religious practitioners. And the reverse holds as well. Religious practice is good for artists. As a Zen priest, I have been saved from freezing by my practice as a poet. As a poet, I have been driven deeper by my practice of Zen. Zen has probably saved me from myself. Poetry has probably saved me from Zen. <laughs> Working with the imagination through art requires discipline. The material you, materials you are working with, even conceptual artists, can't avoid materials, will discipline you. At first, you approach art out of passionate personal need to express your inexpressible feeling. But once you wade in, you find that the medium, the words or paint, movement or sound, is extremely resistant to your self-expression. Things don't just fall into place. <laughs> you have to grapple with the materials, reshaping yourself to suit them. It turns out that making art is not so much self-expression as a dialogue between what we think we want to express and the materials that seem to have their own demands. Engaging in this dialogue moves you to a degree of attentiveness and concentration beyond the private and the personal. It also moves you to encounter art's own traditions, constructed on terms much different from those of religious traditions. Art practice gives you a path into the rich and unique con content of your own life. I don't need art to know what I think and feel. But without art, what I think and feel becomes quickly circular, self-centered, and limited. Making or appreciating art gives me a way to start with what I think and feel and then to plunge deeply enough into it that it becomes not only what I think and feel, but what anyone thinks and feels. And even beyond this, what isn't thought or felt at all. When I write or read poems, I am met through my own thought and feeling by what's outside me. 
In this sense, art practice promotes a profound empathy, a widening of my sphere of awareness. Art practice can help us overcome the weakness we have for religious doctrine and dogma, which everybody loves, even the ones who hate it. Love it. They love to hate it. Art provides a way to discover truth, but not truth that is handed to us already vetted. Instead, we find truth ourselves for the first time. This is a much more in difficult, intimidating, and essentially joyful proposition. Hats. You can't hide behind tire irons. Anywhere on earth, it takes grit to determine weight. And who can know the measure of a grip, whatever way the air holds it down, at least as surely as a boot on a neck a human form of gravity. Now wear a mitre for hedging, if you dare. It will be one more thing worth overcoming. I'm not sure I can crawl out that far anymore, David. Not all the way across the Capitol, like I used to, on my hands and knees and bloody elbows, People formed in icy currents can't but freeze at the ends of days, screaming some choice and pithy monosyllabic words snatched from discarded paper scraps to show their toughness in misspellings and transpositions. We are what we are. And I've been studying this for quite some time. So much time I've forgotten how much future is in front of their faces when they walk backwards. How the powerful dawdle when nothing's going on. Now I'll press play so whatever can't happen can. Using the lever at my disposal, a happy mumbling all over again in the same time frame. It isn't suspect in quite the same way. It's suspect in some other way that I quite stumbled into. And I can't reframe anything that started out as a startled portrait of a lady chasing an ambulance. But does it have meaning? And where would they keep it? If it did, upstairs, downstairs, between or underneath, my hats are legion. I'm wearing several right now. Whenever I speak my mind out of my face, little lesions develop on my forehead, nicks and illusions. Hold out your hand in my direction. Probably there's something we can do. Thought for today. I think of the ordinary, I think of the little ordinary ways I am foolish. I think of matter how hard it is. I can't put my hand through it. I think of thinking, how I can't put my hand on it. I think of my hand as an object of thought, two words. I think of the little ordinary ways I am foolish. I think of the little ordinary ways others are foolish. 
I think of the violent ways others are violent. I think of the innocent ways I am violent to the violent others. I think of violation as inherent in thought. I think of molestation as inherent to matter. I think of my friends and loved ones. Who are they? Do I have any idea? I think of my body in space. Whose body? What space? I think of important things. I think of trivial things. I think of Emily Dickinson. Where are you? I think of the past. A moment ago, a decade ago, did it actually occur? I think of the word actually, what it might mean. I think of various specific words and words in general. How can you think of words in general except through these specific words? I think of using words slowly, carefully, deliberately. I think of the silence in which thinking occurs. I think of God, who is like my dead friend. His absence makes him perfect and comforting. I think of darkness, my old friend. I think of my mind, a marvel. I think of time passing. I think of of and as and if and is. I think of writing as heaven and speaking as space. I think of meaning as beyond and behind meaning. I think of the pleasure of completion and the silence and restlessness to follow. I think of life as being after death and death as being folded into life. I think of floating. I think of the wrinkles on the sea. I think of birds disappearing into fog as they fly. Thanks very much for listening. I appreciate it. What, what do we do now? Does everybody go away, or do we hang out a bit if anybody wants to talk? What are we supposed to do? Because you have been rescued from the jigoku of Zen yes. via your words, yes. we're going to entertain some wordy kind of bullshit here. I OK, think. OK, and good, I, good. I'm yeah. sure he'll take questions. Yes, by the way, <clears throat> I really appreciate <clears throat> your listening. <clears throat> you sat still and listened, more or less, <clears throat> for 40 minutes.
that was a long talk. So that's great. Thank you. I appreciate that. Anyway, what, what did you, what does anybody want to talk about? As if there were anything to talk about. But <laughs> <laughs> Let's do Zazen. Let's do Zazen? Well, uh, we could do that, but the trouble with that is that maybe not everybody wants to do it. And then if we took a vote, then what if we, what we do, you know? Maybe at the end we can do a five minutes of Zazen, okay? Yeah. But I don't want to cut off anybody else who might want to say something. Maybe nobody wants to say anything. I don't know. <clears throat> yes. I knew you I knew you would have. I knew. I knew it. <laughs> <clears throat> well, no, well, don't, don't be shy, yes. Everybody should speak, yeah. Earlier today, we were talking about the ethical dimension of Zen practice. And I'm wondering if you could reflect on the ethical dimension of your poetic practice. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope... Uh, I'm not in control of, of it, so that's the first thing. So I, I can only have a hope and, and, you know, and a desire that it be so. But my hope is that uh, the ethical dimension of my writing would be, first of all, <clears throat> that it would exp express the most permissive possible sense of friendliness first. And second, that it would uh, help the reader to completely and utterly trust herself. That's what I hope for. But I can't really, you know, I don't know if that would ha come about, but that's what I hope for. Yeah. Because sometimes, you know, in, in religious practice, you're given the way it's supposed to be, and then you're not trusting yourself because you think I'm not doing it the way it's supposed to be done, or you know, the, the experienced person knows it more, or the Pope knows more than me, or something like that. So you can't trust yourself fully. <clears throat> but I hope that my writing would give you the, the confidence to fully trust yourself, completely trust yourself. Mm -hmm. Yes? <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yeah. I think when you do a spiritual practice, you, you end up usually becoming insufferable <laughs> most of the time, <laughs> you know, because you become a fanatic, you become, you, you know, yeah. So, <clears throat> so to remain, you know, cheerful and open and willing to think about something else is a hard, is a hard thing if you're a very committed spiritual practitioner. And commitment is the only real way to do spiritual practice, you know, so... So I think you really need to have this built in somehow or other. Yeah, that's what I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. At one point you spoke about like the older relationship to language before the sign. You mm -hmm. the, the magical character of language mm -hmm. to remember. Mm -hmm. I wondered if you ever feel any nostalgia for that. Well, uh, I don't think, I mean, in a way I do, but it's all theoretical, right? Because uh, we have not had that sense of language for a long time, human beings. It's been some centuries since we had a magical sense of language. I think all of our language, you grow up now. Maybe when you're a child, you have some feeling for magical in language. But, uh, but now I think we all grow up with a rational concept of what language is doing. Um, I think maybe in the days when the sacred texts were written, you know, and that sort of thing, there was a sense that, no doubt, people writing sacred, sacred texts were like completely possessed by the magical in their lives all around them. And, and now uh, it's hard to come by that. That's what I meant. Why, do you feel nostalgic for magical language? Yeah. Do you remember a time when you felt the magic in language? Yeah. <coughs> <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe so. Maybe there's a part of us that is also ancient that <clears throat> maybe every now and then when we, recover, when we encounter that 
so maybe that's another thing about a moment of magic and language that when we encounter it in a poem or an imaginative text, maybe that awakens that side of us and we feel it again. Yeah. <clears throat> but I think we're all suffering from lack of that. <clears throat> yes. Does your practice for writing poems differ from your practice for writing other pieces of literature? Uh, yes and no. I mean, um, <clears throat> when I'm writing now, I write a lot of um, essays and whatnot, um, books that would be read um, by a more, a more general audience. Poetry that I write is only read by an obscure coterie of lunatics, you know. <laughs> um, so when I write those other uh, texts, uh, I'm aware, I think of my audience. I, I, I think of them as being part of my process. When I'm writing poems, I don't really, I, I, should, I should double, uh, I should, uh, after, uh, since you bring this up, I'll think about it more. But what I think now is that when I'm writing poetry, I'm not thinking about an audience. I'm not thinking about, does this communicate? Will they understand? Will it do them any good? I'm not thinking about that. I'm thinking about the language in the poem only. So in that sense, they're very different. Um, but the sense of freedom, if it's, I, I, to me, like I, the, whole, I, the whole idea, old idea about the struggling artist who struggles to get it right and just suffers a lot and all this, I have no doubt that there are people who do that and probably write great books. I myself only do it when it's fun. If it's not fun, life's too short, you know. So I have fun, just as much fun when I'm writing those more uh, reasonable texts, there's this, always a sense of play and a sense of fun. If it doesn't have that, I can't really do it, you know. So I'm glad I'm not in college having to write papers. <laughs> I'm very grateful for that, you know. Uh -huh. I jotted down, uh, writing is in no way an instrument of in communication, and you just um, repeated that in a way. Would you say that would be true for other poets like Uh, I, th I think so. I mean, in other words, <clears throat> with my poetry and the poetry that, w that I'm influenced by and that was styles of writing and ways of writing that date to the 1970s, uh, that, that side of poetry is explicit in the more or less the subject matter of what we're about. I think in all poetry, that side is, still, is always there. Uh, it's often not as front and center, not as um, explicitly the subject matter. Although those poets, to me, like I think Emily Dickinson writes the way I do, I think. Not as true of, who else did you mention, Gary? Basho. Basho, like yeah. Basho, I don't read in in the original language, so I have no idea what he's doing. All translations are completely phony, you know, so I have no idea what Basho wrote, so I can't say about him, but I think with Gary, Snyder, and uh, Frost. Frost, yeah, I think they're doing something that's less, it's, it's still there in them, but I think whenever the magic and the music of poetry takes you over, then that's there, but they're not uh, engaging it directly as the writing that was created post in the 1970s and on. Now, many, many poets. Now, now there's numerous schools of this kind of writing now. Uh, and it's now, uh, it's kind of been one of a beautiful experience for me is having writer friends who are like Egyptian poets and African poets, you know, who write in English in these same forms and veins with their whole cultural traditional cultural background as part of it. It's been a very beautiful thing. So it's now an international approach to writing that comes out of the thinking <coughs> of the last century or so and spilled into poetry explicitly in the 1970s. So yeah. our own Emily Dickinson is very modern. She seems that way to me, you know. She seems that way to me. 
Yeah. And, you know, she was writing very privately. That's probably why. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, I'm excited because I might get to go to her house. Yeah. Yeah, her desk, her writing desk is in, uh, I think, the Beinecke Library in Harvard, and I've seen her writing desk. I was like awestruck. Yeah. <laughs> yes. No, no, you, you go ahead. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would be worried if you took it too seriously. <coughs> I would be worried about you. <coughs> if you uh, no, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, 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 uh, sometimes I think about that. I think, you know, so when I'm dead, do I care what happens to my poetry? Sometimes I think, well, yes, yes, uh, it would be a shame after all that writing if it would all disappear. But then I think, well, everything's going to disappear anyway. And there's so much writing already anyway, right? Do I add anything that isn't already said? Probably not. So uh, I don't know. A poet needs a reader. So thanks for being a listener anyway today. And of course, I would be delighted if you ran out and bought all my books <laughs> and read them all and sent me an email saying that you had, I would be a happy man. Yeah. Yes. The what? Well, I must sadly confess that I have not read that book. I haven't been a big Robert Graves reader. What do you think of it? What, what did you have in mind when you asked that? It's, it's above my pay grade, but... Uh, you've, re you've read it, though? Yeah. Yeah. What's it about? I don't even really it's, know. I mean, it's, it's probably some English professor. <laughs> don't be intimidated by them. They're, they don't really know either. Yeah. It's kind of like the antithesis of what you were saying. Kind of oh. Well, Robert Graves, I think, was uh, studied, a serious student of Greek yeah. mythology and wrote, I think he has a two-volume yeah. explanation of all the Greek gods and goddesses. But nowadays, who knows about the Greek gods and goddesses? Do you? Do you? I mean, who, you know, like, tell me a Greek god. I don't know who it is, you know? I don't think Nike is sort of a name. Yeah, no, that's, no, no, Nike is a shoe. Nike is a shoe. You're, you're really mixed up. <laughs> it's a brand of sneakers. This, this I know. The one thing I know, that is, that is the case. I think maybe. Maybe it's time to go. These guys are the, these guys are the harbingers. That when they leave, we know it's all over. Right. Uh, thank you Thank so you. Much. Sorry about the Zazu. But of course, we're not going to leave it like that because um, reading, yeah, first of all, uh, another picture is. Yeah, come uh, to the poetry uh, reading tomorrow. Um, tomorrow is a poetry yes, reading. Yes, yes, yes. 7.30 something. someplace. Yeah, but there's poetry. something else going on before that. If you go to the, you just like Google Smith College Buddhist Studies and you'll find your way there, is the website with all of the events that are going on with, uh, with Norman, uh, as well as with our upcoming speakers, which I mentioned earlier. Um, they're there. We have a host of stuff for Buddhist studies things. If you're, you know, you're in the valley, there's a lot of things that are coming up. Um, everything from calligraphy and uh, Geshe Nangwa Zingye is coming up with um, green para meditations. 
So there's a lot of stuff there, and it's all available on our website. But um, tonight, we are uh, blessed with whatever your Nike shoes are yeah. away from this. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.